This time it's the turn of Microsoft 365 and my top 10 tips and tricks that admins simply have to know. So what are they? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. Greetings my fellow YouTubers, you're very welcome, especially if this is your first time uh, at my channel. Andy Malone, uh, Microsoft MVP, as well as a Microsoft Certified Trainer. First of all, I gotta take my hat off to you and I gotta say a huge thank you to everyone who's helped me achieve uh, over 24,000 subscribers now. I cannot believe it, this channel is just growing incredibly and I gotta say thank you so much and I'm delighted that you're enjoying my content. I really am. I've had some great feedback um, and it, it's really, really encouraging. All right. Now, on this week's episode, what I thought I would do is really take a collection of what I think are my top 10 tips and tricks for Microsoft 365. And these are things that you, you really do need to know. Now, some of you may know some of them, uh, but I guarantee all of you won't know all of them. Okay, now, um, if you've got questions, comments about this or any of my other material, then please, of course, uh, just get that down below and I will do my best to answer it for you. And if you've not subscribed, then go ahead, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and you'll be notified of any new videos. And of course, if you enjoy the video, then please bump the like button. It really does make a difference uh, to my channel. All right, so without any further ado, I think it's about time to jump in to the top 10. This is a really easy one. Simply go into Teams and Groups, come into Active Teams and Groups, and if I scroll down here, I've got a group here called New York Sales, and you'll notice that New York Sales is also a Microsoft team. I simply go in here and a couple of really interesting settings in here. If you go into settings, one of the options that you definitely want to make sure that you've ticked is let people outside of the organization email this team. Uh, very, very important, okay? Couple of other things, of course, um, again, we now have the external file sharing here directly within the groups tab. So no longer do you need to go into SharePoint online, you can do this directly from here. Now you'll notice it's picked up my tenant settings and anyone is actually disabled at the tenant. But for example, if I just want to specify only existing guests here, I don't need to go in through SharePoint anymore. I can do that here. And just while we're here, the, make sure that you know the difference between the public and private groups. So if it's a private group, it's by invitation. If it's a public group, then anyone can join this group. And this is really important. So if, for example, if I click on private here, and if I come back to my 365 portal, click on Outlook, and when Outlook opens, I'm simply gonna come down to the bottom here. I'm gonna come into Discover Groups, and if I type in NYC, uh, you'll notice it's a request to join. So that's really, really important that you understand that. If it's private, it's by invitation, you can request to join, where if it's public, you have no control, anyone can join. So there you have it. Just my few quick tips for Microsoft 365 groups. For my number nine offering, I'm gonna go into settings and I'm gonna come in here into organization settings. And I call this the case of the ownerless groups. Now in Microsoft 365, uh, you'll have noticed whenever you create groups or teams or anything like that, you have the option to put in an owner. Now, if you don't put in an owner, obviously it leaves it empty and you can, you've got a couple of very interesting options here. So for example, group owners play a really important part of things like guest permissions and so on. But what you may not also realize is if you uh, come down to the bottom here, we have this feature called ownerless groups. So all groups must have an owner 
uh, to add and remove members. Owners have unique permissions, like the ability to change group settings. So if there's no owner, then email an active group member. So that's quite a useful thing where you can add, you know, maybe another group member who will take on that role. Okay. And another thing about uh, owners as well is if the group is deleted, the owner will have the capability to uh, have access to that data for up to 30 days. So that's ownerless groups in Microsoft 365 group settings in the admin center. Now I'm sure you'll all know that finding stuff is super simple in Microsoft 365. We have a unified toolbar uh, which runs through all of Microsoft's products and it's context sensitive. So for example, if I type in the word sales here, I can see everything in a nice easy to view list. I can filter that with files. I can have a look at websites. I can look at people within my organization and cool things like even if I float my mouse pointer over them, the card expands and I can find out even more people. So for example, I can look at the organization structure here. So finding content is absolutely fantastic, whether it be messages, images, Power BI documents, and of course, you can uh, open up a particular file to view it. You get a little preview of the document. Um, so that's a really, really cool feature. Now, this is something you may not know. If you go into the settings in the admin center and come down here, you'll notice that in here, we have got something called search and intelligence, and you can actually make search even better for your organization. And we have a number of different tabs. So for example, in answers, you can add in things like acronyms. So every company's got acronyms, for example, AAD, Azure Active Directory, for example. Um, you can also add in multiple data sources. So, you know, if you've got, for example, different cloud services, either on-premises or off-premises, then you can simply add in additional data sources here. You can also bring in customizations as well. Uh, and these can relate either vertical uh, within your organization. You can also manage the schema, the complete set of object types within your organization. And then of course, we have a number of different configurations. So for example, search is based on the Microsoft Bing extension. And of course, Bing um, is famous because it uses AI and it uses machine learning and it's very, very intuitive. So things like answers, I love this. Bookmarks, you can add your own bookmarks in. Floor plans of your organizations. And you can even bring in locations. So for example, a company um, it brings in the address, the details, where the company is and so on. So if you've got multiple sites, for example, which may also link into the likes of Teams and so on. And you can even bring in your own Q and A's. So, you know, what are the most common questions that somebody might ask within the organization? And you can actually add those and they will be available for all of your users. So search and intelligence in the admin settings should be definitely one place you want to visit. Now for my number seven, I'm gonna go down here in the admin center and I'm gonna come in to Microsoft Teams. Now in Microsoft Teams, one of the things that we, we know about Microsoft Teams is that there's lots and lots of admin settings. So for example, if you go into Teams, there's Teams templates, there's Teams policies, there are things like meeting policies, meeting templates, voice policies, and with all of these policies, it can be quite difficult to keep track of things. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but in Microsoft Teams, we have something called a policy package. So a policy package, these are pre-configured um, for different audiences. So for example, uh, for, in, a, in a primary school or in, in a high school or something like that, frontline workers, healthcare workers, and so on. Now, if I go into, let's say one of these, so if I go into a clinical worker here, 
you can see that a policy package is actually a combination of different things. So it's not only a messaging policy, a meeting policy, and an app setup policy. And again, you can go into any of these and you can create your own policy packages as well. So as well as getting these kind of preset things, you also get the opportunity to go ahead and create your own policy packages. And all you do then is you just add it to a user or a group that you want to configure it to. So when you consider that there are literally hundreds of different settings that are contained within all the different policies, then a policy package is such a cool feature. So for my number six, I'm coming here into SharePoint Online. And from in here, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to come into content services. One of the most important features of SharePoint Server in its day was a feature called the Term Store. Now, the Term Store has just had a major upgrade. And this is definitely one place you're going to want to come in order to arrange your data and how it's structured in Microsoft SharePoint. And of course, SharePoint plays such an important part of Teams and also groups because it's where everything is stored. So literally in here we have something called the taxonomy and the taxonomy is the structure of your organization. So the easiest way to describe this is think Windows. So in Windows you have the C drive and then you have your various folders off it. So this is that's your taxonomy. So this is the structure of your data. So you can structure it, for example, people here, we have some examples, uh, and we have these, uh, this is our term store here, and we have different departments, for example. So here we have a finance. So we have terms, and terms are stored within the term store. And you can add things like translations and um, similarities, for example, you can bring those in. And it just makes searching for content and storing content and tagging content so much easier. So you can customize, again, you get a number of kind of uh, default settings here, but you can customize these, you can add in your own locations, you can customize your own job titles, and you can have your own uh, tags here if you want to. So definitely take a look at the taxonomy or the term store in SharePoint Online. So one of the most common questions that I get asked on my channel is how do I manage guests and what kind of permissions do I give uh, to people who want to grant guest access? Well, for this, I simply come into Azure Active Directory here and I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to come into external identities here. Um, and I've covered these sessions previously. If you've not seen, for example, my session on shared channels, for example, external collaboration, then check out my channel. I've done dedicated sessions on those recently. But there's one thing that I want to specifically focus on here, and this is my external collaboration settings. And this is guest user access. So this is, do you want to allow guest users uh, within your organization? And specifically, these settings are absolutely critical. All right, so guest user access restrictions. So guest users have the same access as members. So if you're adding users as members in Teams, they're exactly the same sets of permissions. This one has limited permissions, and of course, this one would have very restrictive permissions. Now, when it comes to inviting guests, anyone in the organization can invite guests, including guests. You maybe not think about that one. That's not a really good idea. Members, of you, members users uh, assigned to specific admin groups or admin roles can invite guests, including guests with member permissions. Again, you're granting guests the ability to invite other guests here. So again, if security is a thing for you, again, make sure that you understand what these settings are. 
Only users assigned to specific admin roles can invite guests. So here we're talking about um, the users that have got the guest inviter RBAC role, and which you can assign in the roles section of Azure AD and Microsoft 365. And of course, global admins, user admins, and so on can all invite guest users. Now, if you want a completely closed organization where you're not having any guests at all, then this is the option that's the most um, restrictive, if you will. Now, um, you can also do self-service sign-up um, via user flows. And this type of guest account is particularly useful for business to consumers. So if you've got an app and you want your users to be able to sign in through a Facebook or Twitter page or something like that, then that's quite useful. Um, external user leave settings. So allow external users to remove themselves from your organization. And what that means is users can go into their profiles in Microsoft 365 and they can, uh, within their profile, they can actually choose to leave an organization at any time. Um, also, you've got some collaboration restrictions. So again, you can set an allow or a block list. So if you want to block specific domain names, for example, again, you can block that here. Um, so some very, very useful settings in the external collaboration settings for guests. For my next tip, you can imagine that there is a lot of confusion in Microsoft 365 when it comes to security. There are so many settings in both the Microsoft 365 portal and of course in Azure Active Directory. What's a really good plan if you, you're not particularly skilled in security, but you want to have a good kind of baseline uh, security settings? For that, simply go into Azure Active Directory, scroll right down, and you want to come into the Properties pane, and again, scroll right down here, and there's a little link here called Manage Security Defaults. You can also find it in here as well. And simply click into here, and you now have an option to enable the security defaults here in uh, Azure. Now, just one little thing, again, this enforces an organization. This is really nice. It's a really nice ground breaking kind of set of uh, tools. But one thing that you might want to think about is if you've already set things up. So you've already configured things like conditional access, multi-factor authentication, because if you switch this on, this will basically wipe any of those settings out. So be very careful um, what you click on. But if it's a brand new tenant, you've not configured anything, then this is a really good idea. Uh, if you want to know more, then you can click into here and this tells you everything, uh, all the different settings, when you should use it, how to use it and so on. So definitely check out the security default section in Azure Active Directory. One of the most common questions I get asked for about Microsoft Exchange is, Andy, how can I send encrypted emails? Well, this is super simple. I'm simply going into Microsoft Exchange Online here, and I'm going to show you a feature called OME, or Office 365 Message Encryption. And because it's super simple, really definitely you want to kind of configure this. So to set it up, simply go into mail flow and you want to click on rules. Now here in rules, essentially what you need to think about is who, um, what, what the rule is. So you can see we have a whole bunch of rules here, including apply 365 message encryption and rights protection to messages. So if you want to send messages to confidential clients, for example, if it's a bank or a financial institution, and you want to essentially make sure that everything gets there, then you can choose this option here. So um, again, I'm just gonna give this a name, so I'll just call this OME1, I don't call it OME2, and, sorry, 
And what I'm going to do is it says apply the rule if. So I'm going to say apply the rule if the sender is. And in here, I'm going to say, okay, if the sender is, let's do the sales team here. So we'll just search for the sales team. So if the, if the sales team, and I'll just add that. Um, and then I can add another condition. Okay. So um, if the sales team is sending to a, let's say a recipient. So I will say, um, we you can use lots of different things you can do. So you can say if this, if the person is inside the organization, outside the organization, and so on. So the, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. So I'm going to say um, is an external or an internal user, and you can say inside or outside the organization. Um, is it in a partner organization, and so on. For the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to specify inside the organization. And you can then, you can see it starts to bring in the rule. All right. So the re recipient is inside the organization. So um, that's fine. And I'll click on OK. And then it says, OK, um, do you want to uh, choose an RMS template? So this is the rights management template and essentially labeling and classification. So I've created some uh, labels here that says sales highly confidential. So basically anything that I send will get, will pick up this label and also any of the encryption settings uh, to it. Um, so you can see I'm sending the sender is uh, the sales team in the organization and, and I can say, okay, the sender is located outside or if it's a person, if it's an individual, I could say, hey, if it's Alex here, for example. So any mails between the sales team and Alex or any of any external customers, um, basically it's going to be encrypted with office message encryption. Now, what happens is when I configure this, um, it will, the user then sends their email as normal. The user will receive a HTML or a, a mail attachment, and it's a HTML attachment. The user clicks on the attachment, and they then need to authenticate themselves through a, a one-time passcode. Okay, so once they've got that passcode, they will then be able to open the restricted and encrypted message. So absolutely superb feature. Definitely try it out. Really, really simple to set up and it will increase your security tenfold. So that's Microsoft 365 message encryption available in Exchange Online. Now, one question I'm always getting asked is, Andy, where the heck is the OneDrive Admin Center? Well, it's not here anymore, but if you pop into the SharePoint Admin Center, and if you scroll down and go into Settings, then look at this. Here we have all the OneDrive Center Admin settings that you're gonna need here. Specifically, if you go into the Storage Limit, now one thing here, now everybody knows that you get a terabyte of storage. Now, do bear in mind that the difference between OneDrive uh, for business, OneDrive for business is for users, and this is a user's work files and things like that. Um, so, and the cool thing is, by the way, if you've got an E3 and above, you can actually change this. You can see 5120, you can actually increase it to five terabytes of storage. So if you're on an E plan and above, five terabytes of storage is definitely the way to go. But what if it's corporate files? Well, corporate files, again, if you come into corporate files here, you can see that we've got sh uh, SharePoint storage limits. Well, technically, you can actually have up to 25 terabytes um, per SharePoint um, document library. So you'll never really run out of space and it's very elastic. And even if you did run out of space, you can also, you can always purchase more. 
Um, so OneDrive for Business is very much for users' files and content like that, whereas uh, SharePoint document libraries, you can either set them as automatic or you can set them as manual. Now, if you set them as manual, if I just flip, flip over here and you can see that it says the storage limit here, 25 terabytes, but I can now manually edit that if I want to. All right, so very, very useful in the settings pane here. Um, I would, to be honest, I would really just leave that on um, on automatic because it deals with it for you. All right, now just before we leave this here, just one other little thing about OneDrive, by the way, retention. So again, depending on your plan, but the default recycle bin, for example, is 30 days here. You can increase that to your uh, for your users and you can see I can I've just chosen 90 days but you can see here um, that's 3650 days um, and that sounds like about 10 years so for legal reasons um, or compliance reasons um, uh, as I've mentioned previously in many of my demos you either delete content or you archive content so there you go um, now whether you would do that for every user I don't know but that is the default settings there and you can change them if you want to for my number one, I'm going to come in here to Microsoft 365 Defender and I'm going to scroll down and we have this section here called Cloud Apps. Now, if many of you are familiar with the likes of Cloud App Security, uh, which was rebranded for Defender for Cloud Apps, um, they're absolutely fantastic feature. And if you've not seen my session on that, then please check out the, the session, the video on my channel. Um, today, though, I want to talk about a new feature. It's called App Governance, and it's been out a little while now, but it's very, very cool. So App Governance is an additional layer of security that sits on top of Cloud App Security. And what essentially we can do here is we can create a product. What we can do here is we can essentially create a policy that will either block uncertified apps or secure app permissions. And again, there's additional policies that you can also create. Now you can base a, a policy on usage, on its permissions, on its certification, and you can also do a custom one as well. Now, to be honest though, with the custom ones, it doesn't really matter because you can actually customize any of these. So for example, if I wanted to create um, a policy that would monitor uh, a sudden increase in the number of users or a new app that's generating an unusual amount of data usage or permissions, um, an app that's got a few too many permissions, then I would definitely want to be alerted about it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to monitor this, a new app with an unusually high amount of data usage. And you can see it fills the uh, template in for me. And I'll just go next. And what do I want to do for the scope? Do I want to apply the policy settings, for example, all, all apps, or just do I want to customize these? For the purpose of this demo, I'll just leave it there. What do I want to do if uh, it does discover an app that's asking for too many permissions, generating too much interest? It could indicate that it's a malicious app. So uh, you can disable the app and you can then go off and do an investigation on it. Now, you can run it in audit mode. So this will generate an audit over a period of time. It can be active and also you can be inactive with it as well. So I, I just want to learn what's out there at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to click on next. I'm going to submit that. So I've now gone ahead and created my policy. So my policy is out here and you can see that my policies are all created here. Now, if a policy, if there was an alert, if it did um, hit an alert, then um, you can see that we can go into the Defender for 365. And also, if there are any alerts, they will, everything comes into the same place. So rather than you having to go off and look in all the different screens, then it, it's really, really useful. You've got, you've just got that one 
place to look at. And likewise with things like the activity log, you can view everything in, in one place. So with the uh, app governance, the idea is that it will generate an alert. It will uh, indicate which of these apps are, you know, you maybe want to take a closer look at some of these apps. And you can see that these are all okay at the moment. Um, as I said, with the overview, you get a really nice kind of overview of everything that's going on. And if anything doesn't look right, then of course you can investigate it. So definitely check out, this is the cloud app, app governance, which is now featured in Microsoft 365 Defender. So there you have it. That's my top 10 tips and tricks. I really hope that you found that useful. Would you have you added something to that? Was there a feature you think I missed out on? What would your top 10 be? I'd love to know. All right, questions, comments, get them down below. And of course, as always, I'll do my best uh, to answer them for you. And if you've not subscribed, then please hit the subscribe button, ring the bell uh, and come and join this great community. And I just want to quickly mention that my Discord channel is up and running again. So if you want to continue the conversation, uh, please go ahead and sign up for that as well. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. And we'll see you next time. You stay safe. Take care. Hey, thanks so much for dropping by today. Here's a couple of videos that you may enjoy. And while you're here, go ahead, click on the subscribe button and you won't miss out.